Anna, Devante, Abigail, Jeremiah, and Sierra, that in telling this story, we are honoring them. At other times, we feel dirty, as if recounting the gruesome but incomplete details of their short lives makes us grave robbers. For Lauren, who has spent countless hours reaching out to the people closest to the Hart family and has endured her share of slammed doors, it's been an especially strange journey. As I was coming up here, I felt like this sense of dread as I got closer and closer to this area. Um, it's been so many months that I've been looking into every last lead that I could find, calling so many people, some who talked to me, many who wouldn't, and uh, requesting all these documents. It's been so much for six months now. And to actually come to the spot where the story both began for me and ended for them, it just, I just had so much anxiety about it, honestly, and sort of feeling of dread about it. In April 2019, a full year after the crash, a formal coroner's inquest will be released to the public. At that time, a jury will convene to decide whether this was a murder by one person, a conspiracy to murder by more than one person, or an accident. And then, in so many ways, it will be over. From Glamour and How Stuff Works, this is Broken Hearts. I'm Justine Harmon. And I'm Liz Egan. There are a lot of people whose voices we tried but were ultimately unable to include in this podcast. In November 2018, over the course of three consecutive days and after several months of outreach, Lauren spoke with Sarah's father, Alan Gengler. He decided not to go on the record. We also reached out to Sarah's brother, Matt, but did not hear back. Jen's parents and her brother, Christopher Hart, declined to speak to us. Her other brother, Jonathan, says his older sister has not been in his life since 2010 and wanted only to make a few things clear. In an email to Lauren on September 25th, 2018, Jonathan wrote, One thing I would like to clarify for myself and my family is that Jen was not ousted from the family for being gay. I have been openly gay, even in high school, and it never affected me living in my mom or dad's home. He continued, if anything, all this time, my family did nothing but try to help and understand Jen, not work against her. Two months after he sent that email, Jonathan spoke with us over the phone. He doesn't want his voice on this podcast, but he gave us permission to relay the following. Nobody has done anything to warrant this, he says. All I have seen my whole life is her getting, my parents, grandparents, anybody, jumping through hoops to give her what she wanted. And that's all I can say. People loved her. They really stuck up for her. It really hurts me when this stuff gets reflected on my parents. That really hurts my feelings. My mother is wonderful, and she did put up with a lot from my sister. We all did. Sources close to the Genglers told us the family had not been in touch with Sarah for a long time, but it was Sarah's choice to cut off contact. The distance, one says, had nothing to do with them rejecting Sarah's sexuality. Back in August 2018, Lauren connected with Hannah Scott, a professor of criminology at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, who has spent a lot of time studying the psyche of women who commit heinous crimes. In addition to her work as a criminologist, victimologist, Scott is the author of one of the only known studies on female family annihilators, or women who kill their children and or their spouses. She said she wasn't surprised to hear that Jen and Sarah fiercely controlled who had access to them and the kids. She was, however, surprised by the way Jen used Facebook to maintain a facade of familial bliss. In the case of an abusive person, it is clear that either one or both of the parents in this family were abusive. The outward impression management using social media is kind of an interesting twist, although most people now are using social media, but nobody, I don't think, has really looked at the abusive partner and how they negotiate their identity. We assume that people who are abusive are abusive both in their private lives, but also in their public lives. And we know this now not to be true. Many people who are abusive in their private lives 
are well respected in their communities and not considered abusive. And this is problematic for us. It's inconsistent. And I think as human beings, we like to see consistency. If you want to continue to abuse and have access to victims in your family, these acts of private violence have to be managed because if you do anything outside the house that might alert people to the fact that you're abusive, you may lose your ability to continue to abuse. Or in this case, I suspect lose the ability to raise the children in a way that they felt was appropriate and not be objected by other people. And, and when we say it that way, certainly we can understand, all parents understand that they should raise their children in a way that they feel is appropriate. Scott says that female annihilators are a vastly understudied demographic. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we as a culture have a hard time believing that a woman or women would kill their own children. As we started to go through the literature and we had discussions and we pursued this idea, as women in criminology, which is largely a male-dominated discipline with a lot of male-focused and patriarchal values, we started to understand that there was something that was missing. One of my first writings was looking at the female serial killer, which at the time when I started my writing, way back in the day, didn't exist, according to many people. And so I spent a lot of time challenging those values and saying, yes, they do exist. And not only do they exist, they exist in large numbers. The monikers that we tend to give to women, both in serial and mass homicide, giggling grannies, things like that, murdering moms, these are very sexist when we compare it to the names that the men are given. We tend to make light of the fact that women may engage in these criminal acts. And as a result, often we don't take them seriously. We don't take them seriously. It's something to keep in mind when considering that cryptic note from a Minnesota child welfare worker after the first incident of abuse was reported back in 2008. The problem, it said, is these women look normal. Though Hannah Scott has never seen a case quite like this one, The continued abuse across several states makes it unique, and there has been little research on same-sex domestic violence. She has seen incidents of women who kill their families with what might sound like a counterintuitive motivator, love. The woman and her children are often separated and living in a separate dwelling, or have left the spouse and are living in another place, even temporarily. They kill their children because they couldn't see them being raised by the opposite parent, for example or they couldn't see themselves actually sustaining these children now that they were alone. We haven't found convincing evidence that Jen and Sarah were headed toward a breakup, or as we explored in the previous episode, that there was some catastrophic future event on the horizon. But their relationship had been strained. Over the years, they had spent months of time apart. Jen would often travel with some or all of the children while Sarah would stay home to work. Sarah was the sole breadwinner, and money was tight. Jen once emailed a friend that she and Sarah expressed themselves in different ways. She wrote, For quite some time, I have felt very underappreciated and taken for granted in our relationship, and at times, unloved. While I know deep in my heart how much she loves me, she is just horrible about showing it. We are complete opposites in this regard. The email continued, I never miss an opportunity to tell someone how much they mean to me and that I love them. As a mom, I have felt that I have been raising the kids on my own. She admits this too. While she loves them with all her heart, she has not been fully present with me or the kids. The last known footage of Sarah Hart is of her leaving Kohl's at 5.24 p.m., on March 23, 2018, three days before the crash and a mere seven minutes before Child Protective Services arrived at their home. She's wearing a dark hooded sweatshirt pulled over her head and is clutching her cell phone. It's impossible to know what was going through her head or if she knew what was about to happen. It's impossible to know what she and Jen did or didn't talk about over the course of the next few days. But Hannah Scott says the unimaginable might have seemed, well, logical to these women. People can be overwhelmed without necessarily experiencing mental illness. In some cases, homicide, even though we feel uncomfortable saying it, can be a very rational choice to some people, given their life circumstances.
Natasha is a practical girl who enjoys facts and science, while Daniel is a boy who loves to write poetry and believes in fate and destiny. Daniel tries to convince Natasha that he can get her to fall in love with him scientifically by asking a series of questions. With just 24 hours before her family is deported from the U.S., Natasha wrestles between love and logic while the two spend the day together discovering a magnetic chemistry. The story is based on the number one New York Times bestseller. So fall in love at first sight with this modern-day romance for today's generation, starring Yara Shahidi from TV's Grownish and Riverdale's Charles Melton. Do you think you could fall in love in 24 hours? The sun is also a star. Only in theaters on May 17th. Rated PG-13. When Lauren met with Mendocino County Sheriff Tom Ullman, he reiterated what he said many times before. He is no longer viewing this incident as an accident. He holds out very little hope that Devante will be found alive. Do I have any hope? I guess I have hope. Do I have any realistic hope? No, I don't. The fact that there's been no indication that he's alive should cause someone to say, well, he was in a car. But I have no problem of someone bringing Devante into our office today and saying, listen, Devante's alive and well, and he was just hiding out. I'd give the kid a big hug and say, we've never met. It's very nice to meet you. Sheriff Allman and his team have spent the past eight months trawling the coastline for the missing children, examining the evidence they do have, and preparing for the upcoming coroner's inquest. Allman says an inquest of this nature hasn't happened in Mendocino County in over 50 years. But according to the law, its function is to inquire into and determine the circumstances, manner, and cause of all violent, sudden, or unusual deaths. Over the course of two days in April, a jury of 12 citizens will rule what the cause of death was for all the bodies found at the crash site. Sheriff Ullman says he hopes to live stream the event in order to put the questions to bed once and for all. We have a job to do is to find out the truth of what happened. We have gathered a team of experts that will be um, making sure that what we're going to say at the inquest is 100% true and accurate. And a coroner's inquest is going to, in my opinion, give evidence that will shock the consciousness of people who are following this case. And what, what can you give? Not a bit. I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm going to tell you that we're not on a fast timeline to throw this information out right now, but I, um, this will be a water cooler conversation throughout our nation. For those who were critical of how long it took to positively ID Hannah's remains, Allman says DNA simply isn't something you can match overnight. I think that TV has presented a false narrative to viewers regarding how easy it is to get DNA. Compare it to fingerprints. Fingerprints are really good if you know which fingerprint to compare it to. I've taken, I'm going to guess, hundreds if not thousands of burglary reports where fingerprints were obtained, but if you don't have anybody to compare them to, okay, so you have fingerprints. And DNA is the same way. If we have DNA, you know, from a foot, and we say, all right, gosh, we have the DNA results, if we don't have anybody to compare them to, then it's the same as a fingerprint. These children were adopted, and we didn't have a lot of information. So it wasn't an easy task to do. He says the biggest holdup in this case has been trying to get information from the adoption agencies. The fact that law enforcement has been stymied at finding out information regarding the adoption records and the accountability of foster parents should concern a lot of people. Whether or not this was a crime or an accident, when it happened, I don't think law enforcement should have been told no by adoption organizations that say, we're not going to give you that information. Prior to this case happening, I had no idea the amount of confidentiality that adoption agencies focused on. While I don't want to disrupt somebody's life with adoption records, when a death happens, I would have to ask myself, why would an adoption agency or government agency be so determined to keep information private? So how much of what happened to the Hart children can be put on the agencies tasked with making sure our youngest citizens are being looked after properly? Dr. Doris Houston, 
the interim director at the Illinois State University School of Social Work, points to the lack of interstate communication between all parties. She also singles out the state of Texas, from where all six children were adopted, as keen to terminate parental rights and collect placement fees from the government. On average, she says, a family like the Hearts could stand to collect $1,200 a month for each adopted child. We have found that, over the past decade, the Hearts have taken roughly $270,000 from the state of Texas. These are taxpayer dollars that are being spent to support children. Why can't we then expect that families would be expected to at least do an annual check-in, maybe go for the first few years, go to some of the support groups? I was surprised to find that Texas essentially has a standard of automatically preparing the paperwork for adoption. It makes it difficult to envision the effort is really being put into family reunification if from day one, that is the policy to begin to prepare children for adoption. Dr. Houston says once an interstate adoption is completed, the state of origin is no longer responsible for an adopted child's well-being. With Texas allowing the children to be adopted in Minnesota, they essentially are absolved of all of those responsibilities. It now rests at the hands of the receiving state. Frankly, there really has not been movement in any real meaningful way to do a national adoption protection registry where information is shared. Hannah Scott, the author of the study on annihilators, calls these interstate disconnects linkage blindness, a term coined by criminal justice expert Stephen Egger. We still do have trouble in the United States finding individuals who both move frequently and kill or commit serial crime. Sometimes cities don't even talk to each other, but states certainly have more difficulty talking to each other. Each state has its own set of laws. We know that there were eight people who reported to the police that there was an use of situation. This happened over 10 years in three states. And once the family became detected, they moved to another state. This stopped the process of investigation in one state and allowed them a reprieve to some degree in the new state that they had moved to. Because the states cannot talk to each other, cases of child abuse like this can go undetected as long as the family continues to stay mobile. April Dinwiddie, the former executive director of the Donaldson Adoption Institute, agrees that this story should serve as a nationwide wake-up call. I was at a camp for families who adopted transracial land, and I, I talked about that case being a cautionary tale of how broken the system can be and how important it is for us all to be taking care of ourselves and doing well and and getting the help that we need and getting the help for ourselves and our children. Um, And I talked about it at another sort of gathering of professionals who some were transracially adoptive parents. And and there's a lot of head hanging and a lot of tears and um, people are feeling it. But I hope that just translates into just more action and more eyes wide open with some of the real challenges that the system faces and and quite frankly that that people face look i didn't know the hearts i don't i don't know what drove these women to to do to adopt to whatever but like there was something clearly wrong there too and even those people who do such things need to have some kind of care and support as well right like they just don't get erased either there's mental health issues in, in all of this that need to be addressed that Clearly, we're not. I've just found, like, when I talk to friends and mothers in particular, that everyone has something to say about this case. Mm. Everyone honestly reads something about their own life into this case and feels guilty about that. Like, even, you know, just like a mom, she has a biological child, and she was just like, yeah, that case just made me look in the mirror and realize how much just utter power you have over young children and how just guileless they are. Mm -hmm. You're all they have in those early years. And it made me almost scared of my own power that I have being a parent. Mm -hmm. There's so many layers, there's so many layers. The power of being a parent is something we rarely talk about in our daily lives. 
but it's something most of us with kids understand in our bones. Sometimes, when I tuck my two-year-old in at night, he recently graduated from sleeping in a crib to a twin size. He gives me this look like, I'm gonna get out of this bed, and I give him another one that says, don't you dare. And he doesn't, he doesn't dare. What a strange influence to have over another person. But what if I pushed it a little further? What if I told him that something bad would happen to him if he got out of bed? What if, and this is honestly hard for me to say out loud, what if I held him down until it hurt? How long would he stay in there? Would he love me any less? Or would his devotion to me become stronger, more desperate? Would he wonder what he could do to make it go back to the way it used to be? Back to when I would lie in his little bed without a blanket and cuddle him until he fell asleep, even though I'm impossibly pregnant and it hurts my back. How much would his mind go Every notice was still stuck on the front door, dated a month after the crash. Dana and I peeked through slits in the blinds. The living room was sparse except for a few chairs, 